covering for your patent. Okay. Later we're going to try this because we have a bunch of baguettes right there. So you can take a spoon, scoop out a spoonful, spread it on your bread, and enjoy it. Also, later we're also going to start dry aging our ribeye. Okay. So I've got some beef ribeyes um, in the fridge, and later we'll talk a little bit about just very briefly about the aging process, what it is, what it does, just very, very mild uh, information related to that. Um, but now we're going to start talking about fish. I don't need, hello, I don't need the egg whites. Sorry, fish. Fish. Who here likes to eat fish? Yes, everyone likes to eat fish, right? Um, so the majority of the fish we eat nowadays is farmed, right? Just because of the uh, history of overfishing or troll troll fishing. Troll fishing is like when they drag a huge net through the ocean, a massive, massive net through the ocean, and collect 10, 15, 20, 100,000 tons of fish at one time. Okay? Several species of fish are now extinct, right, because of overfishing, and several very popular species of fish are on the verge of extinction because of overfishing. And now governments and whatnot, industries are realizing that they can't continue to uh, fish in the way they did before, and so now fish farming has become a very popular trend. Although fish farming has some negative aspects to it, that's good. The whole thing clean up your station, clean up your station, and you're done. Can anyone tell me what a negative aspect of fish farming is? Anybody? Using dynamite fishing. Sorry? Using dynamite fishing. Using land for fish? Da dynamite. Land what? Dynamite. Using dynamite? dynamite? Yeah. Dynamite fishing. No. What? No. No. Uh, dynamite fishing? No. Can anyone tell me, uh, uh, no, one sh no one fishes with dynamite. Can anyone tell me a negative effect of farm fishing? You guys know what farm fishing is? Yeah? You all know what farm fishing is? Does anyone here not know what farm fishing is? Farm fish versus wild fish. We grow. Are you referring to negative effects for like ecosystems or? In general, negative effects. So, maybe destruction to ecosystems? In general, yeah, negative effects. They have more fat. They have more fat. What? They have more fat. They have more fat? That's what they call it. No. So, there's negative, as Connie mentioned, there's negative effects to ecosystems because fish farming is a fairly large pollutant or can be a large pollutant. And they also have, some have been found to have negative health effects from eating farm fish because they have high levels of mercury. Okay, because fish farming is in a contained environment. Okay? So a lot of people think that fish farming is also not a suitable alternative to eating fish. Yes? How does, um, I'm just curious, how does like, farming fish increase levels? Has to do with their feed and their excrement and their their stuff in one container, right? In the wild, there'd be dilution, right, of water, right? But in a contained environment, their feed and their excrement just starts to build up. So there's some concern with some, not all. So a lot of people now, a lot of companies now do farm fishing, but uh, in the wild. So the netted areas in the wild, so they still get that same circulation of water that's more expensive, right? Whereas quite commonly in Taiwan, you'll drive in the south and you'll see tailing ponds, right? Fish ponds. You'll see them with the rudders going to get oxygenated in the water, right? Those contained ponds don't produce the very, the very great product, okay? So if they do uh, farm fishing in the wild, yeah. farm fish generally more expensive than. Yes, generally, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So for sure, you get wild fish, the most expensive, right? 
and then ocean farmed, and then tail pond or pond farmed, right? And you can usually tell fairly quickly when, a, when you purchase a fish if they've been farmed or not. Uh, you can look at a few things, particularly the meat. So farmed salmon, for example, is much paler in color than wild salmon. Wild salmon is much redder or pink, and farmed salmon looks kind of... The I mean, salmon has different varieties, right? So in Canada, we have like eight, nine different kinds of salmon, right? Whereas in Taiwan, they just have salmon, right? They don't know the difference between sockeye, king, chum, Pacific. They don't know, right? But each species of salmon is slightly different in its body structure, okay? The type of fin, to the, not the type, but the shape of the fin, the shape of the mouth, the color of the skin, the color of the meat, uh, even the fat content can be different. So uh, we have we have a variety of different salmon, but if you compare two similar species, like wild Atlantic salmon and farmed Atlantic salmon, and farmed Atlantic salmon is the most common type, the meat, the, the meat of the farmed Atlantic salmon will be much paler in comparison. Okay, a wild salmon is much more reddish, and a farmed salmon is kind of a looks more like guava milk. You know, it looks just like kind of paley. You can just tell right away that there's something wrong. You can also usually tell um, about farmed fish on the tail, okay? On larger fish, a fish, a fish tail is supposed to be a nice fan, okay? And quite often with farm fish, you'll see chunks. Picture a fan, okay, like a Chinese style fan, right? So picture a fan with cuts out of it or chunks out of it, right? That fan is no longer so pretty, okay? Uh, actually, you, know, you can uh, you can set up one one time for yeah, so when fish are in a, a small tailing pond and they have lots of them, they fish, uh, like think about a shark, right? The reason people get bit by a shark is because sharks don't have hands. They can't reach out and be like, what is this, right? So how does a shark figure out what something is? Right? He bites it, right? He's like, is this a tire or is this a seal? I don't know. Let's find out. Not seal the singer, seal the animal. So it's, he's like, oh, what is this thing? Oh, it's a tire. I don't want that, right? Because there's lots of tires in the ocean. Um, same thing with the sand, right? They're just going through the ocean like this, right? Right? And so because they're in such close proximity to each other, they end up nipping each other's tails. They can only basically swim in a circle, right? They just go around all day in a circle, like super boring, right? What'd you do yesterday? I went around in a circle. What'd you do before that? I went around in the same circle. What are you going to do tomorrow? I might go the other way. Right? And so they just keep going around in a circle and they just and so they just get nipped at. So you'll see a lot of their tails are um, are nipped and they don't look so nice. Okay? Um, so that's a bit of the, about the farming industry, the fish farming industry. When we talk about fish itself, okay, um, and we're lucky today. Oh it's it's not a scale. Uh, next time you order fish, make sure you uh, actually it doesn't matter today. We don't, we don't need the scale because we're going to skin it anyways. Um, so when we talk about fish itself though, there's a few things to uh, consider or to look at when you're purchasing fresh fish. Okay? Can anyone tell me what might be something when you, if you buy fresh fish, what would you might want to consider or look at? What would be a... The eyes. The eyes, yes, yeah, very good. What's, what about the eyes? First, well, let's, okay, before we get to that, I'll come right back to you, okay? But that's excellent, very good. What's the first thing you notice about a fish? Smell. Smell, right? What should a fresh fish smell like? Not fishy. Not fishy, yes. That's not what it should smell like. What should it smell like? It should smell like the ocean, right? Now, there's a difference. When people think of the ocean, they think of at a fishing pier, right? And it smells like fish, right? But that's because there's a lot of dead fish there. But has anyone ever been on the ocean? Like out in the ocean? What does it smell like? Salt water. Clean, clear, nothing really, right? That's what fish should smell like, right? A fresh fish should smell like nothing really. And this is okay, it's a loop. It was probably caught yesterday, but it's okay. It's not too bad. At any rate, um, it's still pretty good. We're lucky we got it. Uh, so yeah, first and foremost, the smell should be clean, okay? Uh, the eyes, right? When you look at a fish's eyes, they should be full, okay? So you can see, I don't know if you can see in this. Can you see on the camera? By full, we mean like because of the water content, 
die. Where am I going here? Yeah. There? Can you see that? The rounding of the eye there? See how bulging out that is? So that's a good sign, okay? The eyes, you need to have them bulging out and clear, okay? Clear color. If the eyes are gray or murky and sunken in, that means that the, the fish has been dead for a few days because the water content, as Connie just mentioned, as the fish is dead, it dehydrates, right? So the water, the, the water content in the eyes is going to evaporate and the, the eyes are going to sink into the skull. Okay, so that's a dead giveaway. If they're nice and clear, and you, when you look at the fish, you'll see them, they almost shine at you. Okay, if you turn the fish, and they're nice and bulgy, okay? Okay, so that's what you really want to find right there. Some nice bulgy eyes, clear or shiny. Okay, you want to have a nice clean smell. What's something else I want to look at? The gills, yes. What about the gills? Yeah, it should be bright red, nice red color. So you can see in here, they're like a nice, I wish there was a TV there so I could see what you see. Instead of me going, here, 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 here. Can you guys see in there? So you see it's a nice rosy pink color. Okay, also good. Okay, a nice rosy pink color is an also an indication of a fresh piece of fish. Okay, what you don't want is the, the um, fish to be dark purple or black or like kind of muddy. Okay, because what happens to blood when it comes out of our body? There's a, yes, oxidize, right? Oxidization happens to a lot of things. What What is an example of something else food related that oxidizes and changes potato. colors? Potato. potato, excellent, good example. What happens to a potato when you peel it? It turns what? Brown, Brown black, whatever, right? It turns color, right? That's oxidization, right? What happens when you cut a piece of lettuce and leave it out for a while? It turns brown, right? Not wilt, that's different. But when you cut a piece of lettuce in half, even if you keep it wet, right? it turns brown, right? So oxidization changes the color of something, okay? Which is what happens to the gill. The blood inside the gill will oxidize and will turn from a nice pink or red color to a dark purple or black muddy color, okay? So we got the eyes bulging and clear, we got the smell, okay, we got the gills. What else is important? When I touch it like this, smooth, but what, what if, not slimy, okay? When you get a fish, a fresh, nice, fresh fish, it should be nice and smooth, almost watery on the skin, but not slimy, okay? Slimy is a really bad indication. Now, I can tell you one thing, just by holding this fish, is it's been, it, this was probably killed yesterday, okay? And they, the supplier probably got it yesterday, I'm not sure. But when you get a fresh fish, it should actually go like this. When you hold it up, it should be like this, okay? Either, either one direction like this, and I can turn it and it stays like this, Right? It should be rigid. Okay? It shouldn't be like this. Okay? So this is for sure an indication that the fish is not that fresh. Okay? Probably not caught today. Although I'm sure our supplier will say, no, no, it was caught today, I swear. Probably not. Because if it was caught this morning, it should still be like this. Okay? It should still be rigor mortis. Do you guys know what rigor mortis is? Rigor mortis? When a body dies, oh, I'm sorry. When an animal dies, not a body. <laughs> when an animal or a body <laughs> dies, it enters into what's called the rigor mortis, which is when the muscles, so it, originally the killing, right, after something is dead, it's soft, right, and then after a few hours, it starts to stiff it up, and so the fish will enter into rigor mortis, which means that its body will stay rigid, okay, and that's what you're looking for, okay, if you can get a fish and put it on your hand, and it goes like this, that means that it's really, really fresh. Okay, because it's still in rigor mortis. Okay? After about 24 hours, it'll start to set. Okay? Um, so we got the skin, right? Should be nice and fresh, not slimy. Okay? The eyes should be clear, really beautiful. The smell should be clean. Okay? Uh, another factor should be the meat, okay? the flesh of the fish. When I touch the fish, the meat, what should it feel like? Yeah, it should be firm, right? If I can touch my, so this is a small fish, right? It's very thin fillet, so you can easily put your finger through it. But something like a salmon or a tuna, which is very thick, right? When you push it, it should be bouncy or springy. Okay, if you can put your finger into the salmon, it's old, okay? You shouldn't, like it'd be like putting it into a cow, like, right? You shouldn't be able to put it into a steak like that, okay? So, um, thank you. 
when you're purchasing fresh fish, it's important to make sure that the flesh, if it's portion cut, is already springy. Okay. Another thing to check for is uh, if it's gutted. Okay, so this fish is not gutted. Okay, we don't need to gut it. It's easy enough just to cut the fillet off without gutting it. Um, but if the fish is gutted already, look inside. Okay, feel around inside the belly. Shouldn't be slimy. Look inside the blood. If there's any blood left in there, there usually is. The blood should also be red or pink still, not black or dark purple. Okay. If it's dark purple, that means that it was gutted or portion, uh, sorry, gutted or belly, you know, a day before, two days before, which is also, uh, can speed up the, the rotting process of fish, right? Once a fish is gutted, it speeds up the, the time that the freshest fish for, okay? Exponentially, it'll go bad much quicker, okay? So those are some of the factors that you need to look for when you're purchasing fresh fish, okay? Uh, also, if you're buying portion fish, so, if you're buying a portion fish like this or a big fish like halibut or salmon that's already cut and it's vacuum packed or sealed, uh, you want to make sure, particularly if it's, if it's uh, fresh and portioned, look at the edges, okay? You don't want to see any yellowing or discoloration of the edges or drying out of the edges, okay? Because that means it was portioned a long time ago, yes? If you're planning to freeze the fish, yeah. you should you cut it before freezing? Yes, yes. So, whole fish? Yeah, whole fish. Uh, there's no, it's not good to... Uh, freeze a whole fish. You're better off just to fillet it while it's fresh and then back and pack it and freeze it. But even that's, you know, it's easy enough to buy fish. You know, I, I don't really like freezing anything. Uh, meats, I don't like too much, but fish, I. So just because my dad fishes a lot, and yeah. so I just wanted to. Uh, yeah, I mean, freezes. well, yeah, it just makes more sense to me to uh, gut it, clean it, fillet it, and and back yeah, and pack it. I just gut it and clean it and not replace it. Because I just, we'll, we'll fry whole fish. Yeah, oh, well that's different. If, you're, if you have an intended, I mean, <laughs> if you have an intended purpose to fry a whole fish, then freeze it whole. But, I mean, it takes up a lot of space in the freezer, and it's, I just yeah. don't see the point. But, yeah, of course, we have a, about the, the gutting it. Uh, you should gut it for sure, yeah. Okay, so today, we also want to keep, I need to keep all of the fish bones. Okay, so later after you guys have filleted the fish, you can bring it in here. So there's two main categories of fish, okay? When we talk about fish, there's round fish and flat fish, okay? This would be considered a round fish. It swims like this with an eye on each side of its head through the ocean. The spine is up on the top of the fish, okay? And the fillet is on each side of the spine, okay? There's a flat fish, you'll also notice the discoloration here, right? You see the top is black and the belly is white, right? So as it swims, if a predator looks up, the predator will see the white. It'll confuse the belly with the sky. If a predator is swimming above them and looks down, it'll see dark. It'll confuse them with the, the sea floor, right? So that's natural defense. A flat fish swims like this and has both its head, both its eyes, sorry, on the top of its head. Okay, and it swims usually like this, okay? It'll have two, it'll be discolored as well, but it'll be all black on top usually, and white on the bottom, okay? It has two fillets, one on each side here of the dorse, of the spine down the middle, and then if you flip it over, it'll have two more fillets on each side, okay? So a round fish is two fillets, and a flat fish is four fillets, okay? Any questions about that? Sure. So that's, yes? What about that? Is it considered a round or a round? Round. When you say monkfish, round fish. So that's one category, flat fish and round fish. Another category is sea versus salt. Oh, sorry, fresh versus salt. So some fish are sea, uh, freshwater fish, like trout, some carp, okay? They're born in lakes, they live their entire life in lakes. And some fish are saltwater fish, right? Hamachi, snapper, salmon, tuna, these are all saltwater fish. Even though salmon is born in fresh water, it spends the most it spends the majority of its life in salt water and only returns to fresh water to spawn. Okay? So we can still consider that a saltwater fish. Okay? So there's one category, round and round and flat. Another category is uh, fresh and salt. Another category would be fat and lean. Okay? 
What can what can anyone give me an example of a fatty fish? Uh, salmon. salmon, perfect. Classic example, right? Salmon is considered a fatty fish. What about a lean fish? Sea bass. Sea bass, very good. Sea bass would be considered a lean fish. Okay? So low fat content. Then we have another categorization. Mass market and specialty. What could be a mass market fish? Huh? What? Tilapia. Tilapia. Yes, tilapia is probably the most mass marketed fish because it's the most farmed fish on the earth. Uh, so mass market fish is a fish that you can just go to any store and get. So salmon would be mass market, tuna, tilapia, uh, sea bass even is pretty mass market now. You can go to Costco and buy a huge bag of it, right? And then specialty fish would be something like John Dory or Brill, uh, even monkfish to an extent, but not so much. So fish that is very localized or special and not farmed would be considered a uh, specialty fish, okay? So we have four categories of fish, right? What are the four categories? Round, Round and flat. Not lean and fresh. Fresh and soft. Okay, first one that I said today. Round, Round and flat. flat. Then, fresh or salt water. Then, fat or lean. Then, mass market or specialty. So those are our four categories of fish, okay? All right, so most fish, especially uh, round fish, have the same basic uh, skeletal structure, okay? They always have dorsal fins, uh, side fins, a jawline, okay, a tail fin. Uh, so what we're going to do today is just going to go in through the back of the jawline. Do you guys have fish scalers? Probably not, right? Yeah. You all have? Yes. Oh, perfect. Well, we don't really need to scale the fish today, but we're going to anyways. It's good practice. And I have my scaler somewhere here. So fish scalers come in a lot of different varieties. Uh, this, I find for me, is the nicest variety to use. Okay, I think probably a lot of you guys have those like, yeah, yeah, that's horrible. <laughs> that thing looks like a, some sort of medieval torture device. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, if you're gonna scratch your back with that, you're gonna be bleeding a lot. Uh, I've never liked those because I think that they're too pointed and they tend to tear fish skin. Okay, this is a Japanese scaler. Uh, these are much much nicer. They're obviously more expensive, but uh, they're much nicer on the fish itself. Okay. And these are readily available anywhere. You buy one, it'll last you for your entire life. I guarantee you. I've had this thing for probably 20 years, maybe 15. But you, you're never going to be scaling, unless you like work in a fish factory. And even in a fish factory, they're not scaling it by hand. They have a machine. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and go to scale this over here. So I'm just going to use a little bit of rubbing water. It's also really common uh, to put the fish in a bag and scale it in a bag. Okay, so the scales don't go all over the place, right? And so I'm just going to just gently scale this fish here. And as I said, I really like these Japanese scalers. I find them to be really effective and also good on the fish itself. You guys gonna practice scaling a fish today and filleting a fish. And I am really hopeful that it does not take more than 15 minutes to scale and fillet your fish today. Okay? At most 20 minutes. Okay? At the very most. Yeah? No hour-long chicken thing. Yeah? Like last time. Got it? All right. So in Western, in the Western culture, most commonly we refer to a someone that works with fish as a fishmonger. Okay, that's sort of the uh, classical name, but a lot of people now say like a purveyor of fresh fish because it sounds more, it sounds less. Uh, I don't know. It sounds nicer than a fishmonger, but uh, that's what we consider or call somebody a fish. Some of the deals with fish a lot is usually referred to as a fishmonger. Okay. 
All right, so I'm just going to go in and take off these fold boys. What you see for That's a slippery one there. Normally I would wear gloves, actually. Uh, not latex gloves, but uh, metal gloves. It's easier to uh, hold the fish. I'm going to dry this off a little bit. Always work with a dry fish and a dry towel and a dry cutting board, or else you're going to have a little what we just had there. All right. So I'm just going to go in to the back by the jawline here. So the jaw just runs in right back at the end of the gill here. Okay, where I took that fin off, that's where the jawline runs. So I'm just going to go in at the back of the jaw there. And holding my hand flat down onto the counter against the fish to keep some pressure on it. Just go through all the way down. And you want to keep your knife close to the uh, close to the bone here, the backbone, in order to make sure that you get as much of the fish off as you can. We got one fillet here. I'm just gonna put it over here on the paper towel for a second. And then I'm just gonna flip it over. So I'm just gonna go in again, back of the spine. I'm gonna take the jaw off. I'm gonna take my bones and my guts, and that should just come out as one piece, okay? We'll wash all that off later, but we'll keep it all for making stock out of. And then again, I'm just going to go in on top of the spine here. And then I got one more fillet there. Keep your bones and your carcass for later. And you guys have fillet, you guys have skinned a fish before? Right? So to skin it, and you're going to skin both fillets today. One fillet we're going to cut and we're going to turn into uh, tempura. And the other fillet we're going to cut and dice and turn into ceviche. And so to skin your fish, you just want to go to the tail section here. And you want to hold the skin tight. Okay, pulling back. Some people find it easy to make a little incision here. That way you can put your finger through. So some people find it easier if you do that, right? It makes it easy to pull the fish fillet back as you're skinning. And you want to keep your knife perpendicular to the board. Then you should end up with just a nice little skin like that, okay? The skin we don't need to keep, but the head and the carcass I want to keep. Once you've got it filleted like this, just take off the belly bones. Again, we can keep that. Then you're going to cut just into two strips like this, okay? So you're going to have one strip like this, another strip like this, yeah, got it? And the other fillet, you're going to dice, okay? Any questions? Okay, so grab your cutting boards, grab your fish, grab your knife, and head to a station. Fillet your fish. Huh? Yeah, you're going to need this. You're going to need to. Uh, you're going to need to. Um, what size dice? Scale. I'll do that right now. Okay. 
and the diced fish about half a centimeter by about half a centimeter is fine. And then we'll make one big batch of ceviche together, and we'll fry some fish together, and then we'll just eat some fish. Okay, so that's what you need to end up with. And your carcass and your head, bring in here please. So take a look here please, and this is exactly what you need. One fillet diced, one fillet cut into two strips. Okay? <laughs> this isn't Hollywood, it's more like Bollywood now. <laughs> Alright, oh, that's probably good there. Okay, so our fish is done, in the fridge, chilling. So we also want to make for our, uh, for our, to eat our ceviche with, is tortillas, okay? So, this is not a nacho. This is chip, okay? It's not a nacho chip, it's a tortilla chip. Nachos are a dish. There are two types of tortillas, predominantly there's two types. Does anyone know what this is made from? Corn. Corn. Does anyone know what the other type is? Flour. Flour. Yes. This process of turning corn into tortillas is one of the most ancient cooking techniques ever. Okay? This dates back to the, the Incas and the Aztecs. Okay? Thousands and thousands of years ago. Okay? They created corn is not really uh, we're not really able to process corn in its raw state. Okay? Very similar to cows. I may have mentioned this before. Right, there's I may have mentioned this before in a previous class about uh, animals and the feeding of cows. Uh, some cows are fed grass, we call them free range. Some cows are fed grain mixtures, usually predominantly corn based, which we call lot feeding. Okay, so there's free range or, or grass fed and lot fed. Cows, like us, can't really eat raw corn. Okay? It's bad for them, it's bad for us, right? We can't really digest it, uh, which is why we always cook it, right? The ancient Aztecs and Mayans, they figured out a process called nixtamalization. Okay? Nixtamalization. I gave the boss to hate it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> you can look it up, okay? Nixtamalization. It was created thousands of years ago in South America by the Aztecs and the Incas, or the Mayans, I believe, actually, the Mayans. And what they do is they take corn and they soak it in slaked lime, okay, or calcium, and then they cook it. And that process makes it more edible for us. It enriches the nutrients and makes it edible or dissolvable by humans, okay. That process was started thousands of years ago in order to turn corn into masa, which is a flour, which is what they make tortillas out of, okay. And in, in, in a global cooking class that I teach here, we're going to make, we make our own tortillas, we make our own dishes out of uh, masa, like tamales and pupusas and different South American dishes made out of masa. <clears throat> At any rate, to turn this into a tortilla chip is very easy. Now, do you remember before I talked to you guys a lot about deep fryer and steaming, right? So you watch how much steam. So I've just got two handfuls here of tortilla chips. I'll probably put a little bit less in, okay? But I've got about two handfuls here of cut tortillas. Watch how much steam comes out of the deep fryer now, okay? See all that steam coming out of there? Okay. If you were to put your hand over that right now, it's incredibly hot. Okay. Incredibly hot. Yeah. And you can hear it. Yeah. The water, the oil is also rising up quite a lot. Okay. So when you're, when you're looking at something deep frying, what you look at is the bubbles. Okay. The large bubbles are the water bubbles. The water is evaporating. Okay. Once those large bubbles disappear. You're going to be left with very few bubbles, and that's the remaining little bits of water. And then you can start to get in there and stir it a little bit, okay? But you never want to try to stir it right away, okay? Because it's going to be very, very hot. So we're going to use these to cook, to uh, eat our ceviche, okay? So you can take a container of ceviche, use chips, and just eat it.
Once something comes out of the deep fryer, we want to let it just drain for a minute, okay, just to get the majority of the oil off it. Put it out, and then just a little seasoning of salt right when it comes out of the fryer, okay? Immediately when it comes out of the fryer, we put a little bit of salt on it. Okay. That's going to help it stick, okay? No pepper. Sorry? No pepper. No, I don't need pepper today. It's not really common anyways. You can if you want, but normally in, in South, America, South America, Mexico especially, they just uh, fry chips and put a little bit of salt on it. That's it. Usually because when they eat it with something, they, that, that other product usually has pepper or is spicy already. So again, I'm just going to put these in, let them fry off. And you can see again, the amount of steam that's coming out of there, it's quite a lot, yeah? So while that's going, I also want to uh, start to get our ceviche marinated. So we've got some sliced red onions here, okay? Which we wash in ice water. Well, not me, my friend here. That's gonna help take some of that spiciness or pepperiness away from the onion. Okay, wash some of that milk away. You know when, when people cry when they cut an onion, right? There's usually two reasons. Does anyone know what the reasons are? Your knife isn't sharp enough. Well, that's one reason your knife isn't sharp enough. Onion has like different membranes. Membrane? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's the same reason though. It's because your knife isn't sharp enough. So what happens, you end up breaking the membrane and it releases that odor. If your knife is sharp, you pierce or slice through the membrane cleanly and it doesn't release as much. Okay, so a sharp knife will cry less. But there's another reason as well, and it's the age of the onion. As an onion gets older, it gets more, more potent, okay? Much more powerful in its ability to make you cry. And so as, as an, an onion gets older, uh, when you cut it, it more likely will make you cry. Okay? But the predominant reason is because of a dull knife. So again, I'm going to let these drain off for a minute. Onto some towel. Again, a little bit of salt. It's important to do it right when they come out of the fryer so that the oil sticks to the chip. If you let the, if you let the chip sit for too long, the oil will soak into the chip, and then when you put the salt on, the salt just falls off, right? Okay, so back to our ceviche. I've got some onion here. And ceviche, uh, Basically, a lot of the dishes that people associate with being South American are usually actually Spanish or Japanese, or a mixture, okay? There's a very popular, ah, I'm over here now. There's a, <laughs> but I can't go back over there, so don't, don't, don't worry. Don't worry, my friend. There's a really popular style of cooking called Nikkei, okay, which is like a Peruvian or South American style of cuisine, and that's a mixture of South American, which is Spanish inherently, right, because Spain and Portugal conquered those lands, right, and, and uh, moved there, okay? Um, and also a lot of Japanese fled to uh, South America after World War II, okay? Because obviously Japan was pretty <laughs> not doing so good. Yes, yes, that's the polite way of saying nuclear bomb, a hydrogen bomb. So now I've got our diced fish. It's also important when you're working with fish to make sure it stays cold, okay? So I kept this in the fridge right up until the point that I needed to use it, okay? So now we're going to put some fish in here. Man, this is quite a lot. I hope you guys are hungry. Does anyone here not like raw fish? Good. That would be crazy. All right. So we've got our... Technically not raw, right? Because that's yeah, I mean, it doesn't really cook it, but yeah. yeah. It, it, temp it kind of quickly cures it, yes. 
Uh, I've got some lime juice here, okay? So when people talk about limes and lemons, remember they're not the same thing, okay? Quite often here when I ask for a lime, they give me green lemons. And they're like, yeah, that's a lime. I'm like, no, that's a green lemon. They're like, what's the difference? I'm like, well, they're very different. Limes are much smaller than lemons, they're higher in acid, and they have a very different flavor, okay? So now I'm gonna just give this a nice amount of lime juice here. Of course, if you don't have lime juice, you can use lemon juice, right? But, you know, it's like if I made neo Roman with ground beef. You know what I mean? What do you think Taiwanese people would say if I made neo Roman and I used ground beef? They'd be like, what is this, right? So if you're gonna do something, do it right, you know? That's, I think, one of my biggest pet peeves is when I go to a restaurant or something and I see something on the menu, it's like a dish that I know, and then I get it, I'm like, what's this? They're like, well, it's just a name. I'm like, yeah, it's a name that means something. So I'm gonna mix this around, make sure we get a nice coating of lime juice on all of our fish. And then we're gonna let this rest for a little bit. Okay, we'll let this rest just to start to cure our fish. Okay, I might put a, I'm gonna put a little bit more on there in a minute. And I'll mix it around again, but I also want to add a little bit of seasoning, just a touch of salt, but not very much. Um, when you're using uh, when you're using things like uh, citrus juice or vinegar that acts in a similar way as salt. And I may have mentioned that before, right? That when you're using things like acid or uh, vinegars and lemon juice, so that, it, it mimics the way that salt makes us salivate, right? And so salt is added to enhance flavor, right? That's why we add salt to dishes. Not Some dishes we add salt to the cure, right? But we also add salt to dishes to enhance the flavor. And when you add acid, it does the same thing. It makes you salivate, which helps you taste better. All right, so we're gonna leave that. We're gonna let that, we're gonna let that go for a minute. And I'm gonna get some more chips going here. Should I just cook them all? Do you guys like chips? Yeah. Of course you do. That was a rhetorical question. I knew the answer would be yes. No one says no. Do you like chips? No! Disgusting chips. Sam, can you put your bread in the oven, please? Shish any dog? Then after we get this last little batch of chips done, then we will change this oil to some smaller pots and we'll start to cook off some tempura fish also for you guys to eat. Here, okay. They're not that bad. They're a little bit. 
they're hot in the beginning and then they're kind of they kind of go away. <coughs> Which is fine. Alright. Next, I've got some celery here, just some very finely, some small diced celery. No, it's chives that you just put in, right? Yep, chives, yep. Not to be confused with Chinese chives. Different <laughs> things. So the reason, I think I asked a couple people here today, like you guys took study of ingredients, right? Yes? But in your study of ingredients class, you learn basically only Chinese cooking ingredients, right? Not really Western, right? Yeah. When I took when I taught that course, it was everything: North America, Europe, South America, Africa, Asia, Australia. You know, because there's not much good to teach a course on study of ingredients if you only study ingredients from one one country. That's more like study of an ingredient. At any rate, I need to. Rectify that situation. All right, so again, I'm just going to get these chips out of here. Sam, why don't you go ahead and get that bread out of the oven? Internal timer. Well, internal timer. Okay. So, like I said, Last week we made this. Uh, the oven's this way. Is it? I like I said last week, we made our our pate, right? Chicken liver, foie gras, little bacon, cream. And then on top of this, I put just a little pork wine jelly. And so this you guys can try. And you can take a, bit, a, a spoonful of it, okay? And you'll see now when it comes up, you'll have this nice pate, okay? So you guys, I'll put this in the back here. And what you guys can do is take a piece of bread, smear on some of your pate, In an orderly fashion. Yeah. <laughs> for a batter for our uh, fish fillet. Okay. So we're gonna take our little skinny piece of fish. In classical French cooking, that little slice of fish we call a tronchon. Okay, a tronchon of fish would be a, a strip of the fillet. Okay, so if a French chef asks you for a fish tronchon, you're not going to say saumon. Okay, so that is what is a classical French uh, cut of fish. Okay, in meat that would be called a suprême. Tronchon is a slice of fish. Another classical name for a piece of fish is called a goujon. So they have different names for uh, all the classical cuts. Okay, so we've also got some fresh coriander here. Oh, who doesn't like coriander? Who? Oh, well. You don't like I won't put so much then, so it's slightly more. He doesn't like what I make. I don't think anybody likes what you make. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That hurt. <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> that hurt lost his feelings. <laughs> you What the hell? Yes, so powerful. Yeah. We have lots of uh, lots of pate, so help yourself. You can smear a lot on. No big deal. 
All right. Quiet. So we got fish, lime juice, sliced red onions, chives, chilies, coriander, a little bit of seasoning. I also want a little olive oil to have right here. Good quality olive oil. And can you get, uh, Sam, can you set up one cutting board, please? So we're going to get a nice amount of good quality olive oil in here. Over there is fine. If you look in the fridge here, you'll see some kind of potatoes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question about like, fish. Um, I mean, they might Yeah, parasites are being inside of it. The foil is garbage. I mean, yeah, there's parasites in fish, but I mean, there's parasites in most things anyway, so. so it doesn't make a difference. Some people, some people. Because I mean, I'm trying to get, like, you should freeze the fish overnight or. Yeah, that's optimal, yeah, for sushi. But that's, that's based on like, uh, that's like hassle regulations, you know what I mean? Oh, Food safety okay. regulations. If you ask any like traditional Japanese chef, they're gonna be like, I don't care. Yeah. But like I said, that's... Okay, thank you. Japanese traditionalists would tell you that you have to, that you don't freeze. Right. But for food safety regulations in most countries, they tell you. You need to. I have it. In, I have it. I have it somewhere. It's uh, okay. I'm freezing for to minus 18 for seven days, or minus 30 for two days. I can't remember the exact regulation. But there, there is like an actual regulation. About it. And that's mainly for like uh, if you're planning to do sashimi stuff. Yeah. to our ceviche is sweet potatoes. So my good friend Sam over there is very slowly, incredibly slowly, almost at a Jurassic pace like an iceberg, slowly, very slowly peeling those sweet potatoes. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's lots of pate. There's lots of pate left. There's more in the fridge, so if you want more, take more. Because you don't need to. Take some home, you can. You can't take it home in the jar. 
Tortilla chips here. <laughs> and there's more pate in the fridge, which I don't want, so if you guys want to take some, you take it. How about a Huh? How about the jar. No, the jar is from the school. You just take it out of the jar and then put it into it. Do you have a container? All right. So, I got rice flour, potato flour, water, vodka. Okay? Vodka? Vodka, yes. I mean, it's not really vodka. I drank it earlier. Now it's just water. Um, most deep frying batters contain alcohol. Does anyone know why? Huh? Crispy? Okay, but why? You don't can't just say a word. Well because <laughs> How do they make vodka? What's the process called? Because of the D. Distillation. Distillation. So how is distillation achieved? What do you have to do to something? You boil it. Yeah. You boil it? You take it to the oven. You heat it up, right? Boiling and heating are different, right? So what boil? What what evaporates faster, alcohol or water? Alcohol. Alcohol. So if I make a batter that has alcohol, that means that the water content or the, the moisture content of that batter is going to evaporate faster than if I use straight water. Okay. That's the reason why we have um, vodka in here, okay? So I'm going to add water, not all my water, and then I'm going to add all my vodka. Remember also that depending on the climate you're in, you may need less or more flour, correct? Yep. So what is the, what determines, like I said, the, uh, the environment, right? The climate? In Taiwan, for example, comparatively, uh, let's say 
I don't know. Uh, in France, compared to in France, compared to uh, Taiwan, which climate is more humid? Taiwan, right? So, in Taiwan, do you think the flour would can, would be able to, to mix with more liquid or less liquid? Less. Less, right? Because it's already absorbed flour, uh, sorry, it's already absorbed moisture from the uh, atmosphere, right? Okay, so I'm going to add a bit more water to this. Done? Can we use other liquor? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can use rice wine, you can use gin, you can use rum, anything really works. Even beer, right? Very common, beer batter, okay? That's very commonly used in Europe and North America for making fish and chips, very classical dish, right? So yes, you can use any you can use pretty much any kind of liquor you want. Does it affect the flavor? What? Does it affect the flavor? Well of course. Everything <laughs> vodka is very neutral, right? So yeah, of course. Anything will affect the flavor, right? Beer will have a much much more distinct flavor. You can bring that over. If you use beer, does carbonation? Carbonation helps, yeah. Yeah, it changes it. And you can sprinkle those in. And then gen gently mix them in. I say sweet potato bay. <laughs> sweet bay. Sweet bay. <laughs> potato bay. It's too bad. It's holding this. Uh, I also put a little pinch of uh, baking powder in here, like inside the container. <laughs> Look at this. this. He's got like a, a virtual football field to sprinkle it. He's like, ooh, oh, I missed. <laughs> we'll try again next year, folks. All right. So I've got here my tempura batter, just very nice, very light. Okay. And what I'm going to do is just grab my fish, which again I've kept. The chiller, okay. And we got lots of fish. Just gently mix it in. Okay. Get ourselves a, what's this guy's nickname? Ceviche Sam, Sweet Potato Bay. Ceviche. Ceviche. Who said that? I like it. Ceviche. Yeah, that's it right there. Ceviche. I'm gonna ask the school to change their name. Sandwiche. <laughs> Alright, we got a little bit more corn flour here. And look at that. Yes. Alright, so we're gonna let this marinate just for a little bit longer, okay? But that's essentially your ceviche, okay? Most people I found uh, are fine quite often, especially in countries that don't really know too much about other countries' food. Uh, when I get ceviche, it's very rare to see it with sweet potato. Almost never. So this is the most common way of serving it in Peru. It's always with uh, sweet potato because they want the sourness to be balanced out by that starchy sweet flavor. Okay? So I'm going to move this over here. So we've got a little bit of ceviche to eat. And again, this you can take home. You can take some tortilla chips home. Uh, it's great after a couple hours, the flavors will really have developed and come together a bit more. So now, we're going to get onto our fish fry. So I've got a tray here. Again, mise en place, mise en place, mise en place. You're done. Right? I'm not waiting until I need my tray, right? I'm getting my tray before I need it, right? Everything is already done for me, okay? Before I start doing my job, got my tools ready, okay? Everyone always talks about mise en place, right? That term, it gets thrown around a lot. You always say, oh, mise en place, oh, mise en place, oh, mise en place, right? But it doesn't just mean food, 
right? It's everything you need to do the job properly, okay? Remember that. Before you start a job, especially if you're hot cooking, right? If you're hot cooking or baking, you can't start doing something and be like, oh, oh I need a pan. Oh, I need to turn the oven on, right? You have to have everything ready, right? That's why most recipes you'll see things like preheat the oven, assemble tools, assemble ingredients, right? Because you need to remember to do that every time, right? Don't just start, I know you guys are like, yeah, I wanna do something, yeah, right? But you have to do it the right way, okay? If you develop bad habits now, it's gonna be much harder for you to break them in the future. Okay, so I'm gonna take a little bit of my fish, just gently dust it in some corn flour. This is just gonna to help to keep my tempura batter sticking a little bit, okay? And I'm just gonna to go to the far one here. Let that drizzle off. And so I just kind of swim it around a little bit. See, I'm just kind of moving it around. I haven't quite let go of it yet. Okay, and then I let go of it. And then it starts to, to puff up. All right, who would like to come up and start to fry some fish? I also made, I, I know boss, I know you would for sure. That was like, in my mind, I was like, other than boss, who would like to come? I also made a sauce here for you guys, okay? This is called remoulade, R-E-M-O-U-L-A-D, R-E-M-O-U-L-A-D, remoulade sauce. And this is a mayonnaise-based sauce from France. Basic mayonnaise with capers and herbs, okay? This one has dill and parsley in it, okay? And lemon juice, okay? So this one you can also use, take a little spoonful with your fish, okay? So my tempura here is just cooking away. You see it's just nice and crispy here. Oh, these tongs are not, not so great. I'm gonna switch to these ones here. These ones probably can't even pick up a piece of fish. Uh, they're okay, but not great. <coughs> okay, again, I, make, I wanna make sure that my temperature, right, oil temperature is pretty crucial, right? If the oil is too hot, the fish will burn before it cooks. If the oil temperature is too low, it'll absorb too much oil before it cooks, it'll become greasy, okay? Quite often, have you guys ever eaten something that's been deep fried, it's been greasy tasting, right? That's because the oil was too low in temperature, okay? Okay, so now I've got my nice piece of crispy tempura fish, okay? This is gonna go onto my tray, okay? And I'll let that drain a little bit, and then later I can take a little bit of my remoulade sauce and put it in. So who would like to come up and do some fish? One, two, three, four, five. But not all at once, okay? I don't need 50 people up here trying to deep fry. So you two, boss and uh, Kevin, right? Ooh. Up here first. Wash your hands. Remember guys, you have two hands, right? So you see I just did two pieces of fish at the same time, right? And you swim them around a little bit, just like they're back in the ocean, right? Swim, swim, swim in the deep fryer ocean. In a very hot ocean. In a very hot ocean. It's kind of like what our oceans are getting like. So very briefly in the corn flour, and then right into your fryer. Yeah, good. Good, good, good. Get in. Get the tail. Don't, don't put them like right in so your tail let go. Yeah, 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 there you go. There you go. Okay. And then just let it shake off a little bit. And this one. Right to this one, if you want. Yeah, that swim around a little bit. Float around. Good. Okay, and you can let it go. Great. Wash your hands and go sit yourself down. Usually, you see what boss is doing here? Uh, <coughs> boss had him by the head of the fillet as opposed to the tail. Normally it's better to grab him by the tail because it's skittiest, right? So when you're picking up the fish, make sure you get it in the tail section. Okay, so there's our fish done. And where does where does tempura come from? Huh? 
Where? Anybody know? Portugal, yes. It's not necessarily from Portugal, but Portuguese sailors, when Portuguese sailors went to Japan long, long, long ago, they introduced the process of frying fish to Japanese fishermen, uh, particularly in a batter. Um, and it's named after the Knights Templar, which is an old religious thing uh, in Portugal. So like I said, we have more pate, so if you guys want to take some home, you can take some now. And if you guys, who's, who else wants to do fish? Okay, you two guys come down, and then Lucy, and who else wants to do some with Lucy? So you can come down a little bit after, okay? So you, you two first, then you two after, okay? Okay, there's some fish here if anybody wants to come down. Six people can come down. Six people, half a piece each for now. First six people down here. Can no one go? Do you have containers on the each one? Are you going to break it? I think you're strong enough to break it in sufficient half, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. Break it half. Hey, come on people, let's go. Let's go, there's sauce here as well. Yeah, perfect. Great motion. You've done this before, haven't you? Yeah, it's dip it in. There's sauce here as well. There's more. Come on, people. Let's go. We've got lots of fish to eat. Not the container, though. Cut it in half. Make sure everybody gets some first. Okay. Let's go. we got lots of fish here. There's sauce here as well. Take a dip of the sauce. Take a spoon of the sauce. Whatever it's up to you. Who else wants to do fish? Lucy. For a wholesale cut. So this is what most restaurants would buy, or even a lot of hotels, unless it's a very large hotel. Large hotels would have their own butchery shops inside, and they would get a carcass of beef, a half of beef or a side of beef, and then they would cut all the primal cuts from that, okay? So this is called a ribeye, okay, ribeye steak. This is from the back part of the cow. Sedentary muscle, remember that the cow has two different types of muscles, right? You remember what they are? Sedentary and? Motion. So which one are tender? Sedentary. Sedentary, right? They don't do a lot of movement, which means they don't have a lot of connective tissue. And the more, more, more muscle movement you have, the more connective tissue you have. Okay? So this ribeye, one of these is Canadian, one of these is American. Okay? But they come from the same part of the animal. And basically what I did was I took these out of the uh, fridge yesterday, unwrapped them, and then just air dried them a little bit in the fridge uh, so that when we put them into the dry aging fridge today, they will be uh, a little bit drier to start with. So when we get beef naturally, it's always wet aged, okay? Does anyone know what that means? Wet aged? All that means is that, and this is very similar to what we talked earlier today about with the um, fish. Rigor mortis. Sorry? Yeah. 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 Oxidizing yeah. combination by back and back. But what it is, is when we get beef, okay? Well, normally when we purchase beef, it comes in a vacuum pack, okay? In that vacuum pack, it's full of water, okay, which looks like blood, but it's not blood, okay? It's water that's colored red from the hemoglobin of blood, okay? The animal, when it's killed, so, so before the animal's killed, it's rendered unconscious, okay? Or, depending on the, the slaughterhouse, or they're just plugged, okay? They don't really know what's going on, then they're plugged, and they just bleed out. 
a lot of slaughterhouses, what happens is the cow walks into a machine, and basically within a split second, the cow's back legs are cinched together, okay? And at the same time, a bolt is drilled through its neck or through its head, okay, or both. And at the same time, the legs are pulled up from behind it, so the animal is swung up into the air, so it's hanging head first. It's unconscious, it's dead now, and it's also bleeding out very fast because the heart is still pumping, right? So the heart's still pumping the blood out, and it bleeds out really, really quickly, okay? From there, the animal is left to sit for a few days for the rigor mortis to go in and then go out again, okay? Then it's butchered, you can just leave it there, it's fine. Then it's butchered into whatever specifications that butchery house does. So a lot of industrial butcheries, big ones, will we'll process cows into carcasses or sides, right? Or front quarter, hind quarter, or primal cuts, okay? From there, those cuts are then sent to a secondary facility, a processing facility, that will cut them into um, fabricated cuts. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, can you feel it? Fabricated cuts. Okay, which means that they're portion cut basically, okay? Now, it's not ideal if you own a restaurant to be purchasing fabricated cuts, right? Because if you're buying fabricated cuts, who are you paying to cut your meat? The, sh the factory, right? So you should be paying, you are paying your cooks already, right? You should be having them do it for you, okay? And usually it's better because, for example, when you buy a, a primal like this, Okay, the end piece here is usually trimmed off a little bit, the end piece here is trimmed off a little bit, and there's also usually a lot of trimming that comes from it. That trimming can be used for a lot of things, okay? Um, the best hamburgers are made by a mixture of different cuts, okay? So usually, when I make hamburgers, I mix sirloin, chuck, and short rib, okay? Ground beef, when you buy ground beef from a store, it's anybody's guess what is in there. It's probably all beef, probably, maybe not, and you have no idea what what um, standard of animal it came from, right? Prime, select, choice, standard, class B, class C. Class C is used for like animal food, <laughs> right? So you never know when you buy ground beef. So when you go to a restaurant that makes their own ground beef, like, and usually restaurants will specify, right? We make our own burgers in house they usually take a little more care to process the meat a bit better, okay? So when you buy your own primal cuts like this, you get all the benefits. Yeah, it's a little bit of extra work. <laughs> that's, the, that's the 29th student, the ghost student. You said sirloin, chuck, and short rib? That's what I use, yeah, usually. Yeah. Sirloin, chuck, and short rib, yes. Chuck, chuck, the majority of it's chuck, because it's cheaper. So I'd probably use about 6% chuck, 20%, 20%. Uh, the ribeye, or the sir sorry, the sirloin is to give it like a steaky flavor, and the ribeye is to give it more fat content. Ribeye? Who said ribeye? Sorry, short rib. The sirloin is to give it like a steaky taste, the short rib is to give it more fat content, and the chuck is because it's cheaper, okay? Um, <clears throat> but that's me, and I also grind it at different, uh, when I make, Hamburgers, I also grind them at different. Do you guys want to make hamburgers one day? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. All right, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> right, she gets one right answer. She's like, yeah, we want to make hamburgers, fool. You know it. All right, well, then we'll just do that. Um, so, yeah, normally I grind them at different sizes as well. So, for example, the chuck, I grind very fine because that's kind of my binder. The short rib, I grind a little bit bigger but not too big because that adds some fat and I don't want the fat to melt too fast in the burger. The sirloin, I usually hand cut and mince so that when you eat it, you get chunks of steak essentially, right? Because a sirloin is a steak, okay? It's not a very popular steak in Asia because people here think it's too tough. It's too much, it's too much work. I personally, I hate, I don't really like tenderloin. For me, tenderloin is like, like something that you would feed to a grandfather, you know, like no no teeth, you know, right? Because it has no connect, it has very little connective tissue. If it's got good marbling, then it's um, then it's really really tender, right? 
I like my, when I want a steak, I want a little bit of chew to it, right? So for me, the ribeye is the best, for me, okay? But a lot of people say, yeah, this is the ribeye. So when I want a steak, if I go to a restaurant and I have an option of tenderloin or ribeye, every time I'm taking ribeye, every single time, no question. Tenderloin for me is, is I don't know, it's pointless, you know, it's like eating mush, like beef flavored mush. It's like beef flavored chewing gum, okay? Now the other thing, so before we get into the actual process of aging, we gotta kinda of speed up here because I need to, I wanna show you quickly about sharpening your knives and also we have to clean up. Um, when we talk about cutting steaks, uh, there's one thing I have which is a massive pet peeve, okay? Have you ever been to a restaurant and they say like, uh, you get a ribeye steak and it's six ounces, okay? But you get the steak and it's maybe as thick as your finger, like this, right? Or maybe like your pinky finger. You get one steak, very, very skinny, right? And to cook it, they just hold it over a flame and they put it down on your plate, right? I would much rather, if you cut the ribeye in half this way, and gave me a thicker, shorter piece. You understand what I mean, the difference? So instead of cutting a steak this thin, right? Which when it cooks, you can barely cook that medium rare or medium because it's gonna overcook very quickly, right? I would much rather have a steak this thick and this wide. You understand what I mean? Because a good steak should be caramelized dark on the outside, right? You should have dark brown caramelization, okay? Do you guys know what that is, by the way? That, that process begins with an M? It's called the Maillard reaction. Yeah, have you guys heard that before? Yes. M-A-I, I would assume you have. M-A-I-L-L-A-R-D, Maillard reaction. So the Maillard reaction occurs when, when carbohydrates and sugars, natural carbohydrates and sugars in meats and proteins and other products caramelize because of heat, okay? So when you cook a piece of meat, you want to have a nice golden brown color on the outside. That gives texture and flavor, okay? Have you ever had chicken that's been just boiled? It's horrible, right? But if you have a nice piece of roasted chicken, it's delicious, right? Crunchy skin, caramelized taste, right? So that's what you want from a steak. But if you have a very thin cut steak, you don't have enough time to cook it to get the caramelization and the crust on the outside before the inside is already overcooked, okay? Uh, also, when you cook steaks, never cook them directly from the fridge, okay? So never take a steak from the fridge and try and cook it, okay? You should always let it sit for at least 30 minutes at room temperature because you want it to be room temperature out, you know, before you cook it. So that when you cook it, the inside is slightly warm, okay? There's nothing worse than having a steak that's basically well done on the outside and cold in the middle, okay? That's absolutely horrible, okay? All right, so what we're gonna to do today is, well, I'm gonna do this myself later because I can't take you all, but uh, today I'm gonna to put these into the dry ager. We're gonna dry age these for four weeks, okay? After four weeks, you're gonna notice a significant difference in the uh, color, the smell, and the general look of the ribeye itself, okay? So uh, is, there, is there one red bin over there that's clean? Is there a clean red bin? Can I, have, can I have it? I'm not just curious if it's red, then I'd like it. Usually if I ask if there's something, it's because I want it. Not just because I'm curious, like, I wonder if there's a red bin over there that's clean. Do you think there is? I bet you there is. <laughs> because I want it. Um, so upstairs they have a dry aging fridge that they're going to let us use. We don't have, obviously we don't have one of our own. We don't have a kitchen of our own, so why would we have a dry ager? Um, so what I'm going to do is just transport this upstairs. And I've got some trays of salt here, which I'm gonna, just some coarse, some very coarse rock salt, which I'm gonna put underneath, and that's gonna help absorb some moisture from the air, okay? Um, I have in the past, I have, uh, when I worked in Taichung and when I worked in Taipei as well, we converted our restaurants, one restaurant, into a, uh, is there more paper plates? We converted one restaurant into a high-end steakhouse, and so we had to build out fridges, dry-aging fridges. And so in an industrial dry-aging fridge, it's a very large walk-in cooler, and they regulate the humidity of the air and the temperature. Another thing that is also common in very large-scale um, dry-aging operations, and when I say large-scale, I mean like when I was at the hotel, we would do about 
two or three hundred ribeyes every month. Okay? So in one week we're doing 20, 30, 40, 50 ribeyes. Okay? Just constantly changing them out. One shelf was one week, two weeks, three weeks, and then upstairs in the restaurant was the fourth week in the display. Okay? Um, we also had UV lights, okay, you know, ultraviolet, right? So we had installed in the ceiling ultraviolet lights. So when we turn the main light switch off and close the door, we turn the ultraviolet light on. And the ultraviolet light will kill, help kill bacteria, okay? And so when we're not in the fridge, we can, we can also be um, killing bacteria and making sure that the, the process of aging doesn't go bad, okay? We also had in the walls were salt blocks. So all the walls around were large salt, pink salt blocks. And that helps to absorb moisture from the air. Salt is a natural absorber. So large salt blocks, what they do is they'll absorb air, uh, humidity in the air, and they'll lower your humidity in the room, which helps to dry the beef. When you age beef, you're looking to do two things. You're looking to increase the flavor, and you're looking to increase the tenderness. Juiciness, some people say it, it makes it more juicy, but that's not really possible. Because what makes a steak juicy? What's in steak? What moisture? That's not moisture. Water, yes. What are most animals made of? Water, right? So, if I put my steak, my, my beef, into a dehydrator or a dry ager, I'm letting the water evaporate, right? So how can it make it more juicy? If I'm evaporating water from the meat, how would it be possible to make it more juicy? So some people say like, oh yeah, ten, uh, dry aging meat is all about the flavor and the tenderness and the juiciness. How can it become more juicy if I'm evaporating water? From it? That's like saying dried mango is more juicy than a fresh mango, <laughs> right? Is it? Of course not. Have you tried eating dried mango? It's like a fight to the death. You're like, right? So I don't, I don't buy the, the more juicy thing. I think that's just a like a psychological thing. People think like, well, it's dry age, it's, uh, you know, it's all this, that, you know, I don't buy into that. Scientifically, it doesn't make sense to me. The tenderness part, for sure, because natural enzymes in the meat start to break it down. It's decomposing, right? But in a controlled fashion, okay? And the flavor, again, if, what are we, what are we getting rid of when we put this in the dry ager? Water, right? Moisture, water, right? So, if you take a pot of soup, right? Let's say you have a pot of onion soup and you let it evaporate by half, will it be stronger or weaker in taste? Stronger, right? So for sure, just by using the logic, tenderness, yes, because the enzymes break down the meat, right? It's decomposing, right? Uh, flavor, yes, because we're evaporating moisture which concentrates flavor, okay? So there's a, there's a, a concentration of natural beef flavor, there's also uh, an addition of another flavor, okay? It creates sort of a, more of an umami taste as well. So there's a protein in here that changes as it evaporates and becomes a different flavor. Okay, so what we do is we concentrate the flavor, we enhance a new flavor, and we increase the tenderness, okay? But juiciness, forget about it. It doesn't make sense, right? It's like oxymoronical. By evaporating water, we make it more juicy. That doesn't make sense. It's like I sweat all day long, so my shirt's drier. <laughs> doesn't make sense, okay? You got me so far? Yes. Typically speaking, when we dry age beef, tenderloin is not a great option, okay? Because tenderloin is a very small muscle, and after, when you trim a tenderloin already, you lose about 25 to 30%. If you dry age it, you'd lose a lot, which would make the cost be very high, okay? And like I said, tenderloin's already very soft, so some, I've seen restaurants before put dry aged tenderloin on, and I sort of roll my eyes like, you know, like, what's the point, you know? It's like dry aging water to make it more tender. Um, so the ribeye is one of the more common ones. New York strip loin or a strip loin steak is also very common, as well as a porterhouse. Okay, a porterhouse and a T-bone are not the same thing. Have you guys ever heard of a porterhouse or a T-bone steak before? Yeah, so a T-bone steak. On one side is the strip loin, and on one side is the tenderloin. Now, some people often will conflate or confuse the terms T-bone and porterhouse being the same thing. 
but really in, in like steak talk, steak talk, steak talk, they're not. The T-bone comes from the short end of the tenderloin, so it's got a smaller piece. So you have a larger piece of sirloin and a smaller piece of tenderloin. That's the T-bone. And then as you move up towards the head of the tenderloin, you get a bigger piece of tenderloin and the same size strip loin. Strip loin is like a ribeye, it's one whole muscle, it doesn't really have much difference from start to finish in size, right? So the difference between a porterhouse and a T-bone is that you get a much bigger section of tenderloin with a porterhouse as opposed to a T-bone, okay? So if you see on a menu, porterhouse and T-bone, <clears throat> now you'll understand the difference and you'll understand why the price is different because the price is different, okay? So those two are also commonly uh, aged as well, okay? Uh, there's also another cut called the tomahawk steak, which is like really popular now. Um, that's like, yeah, basically it's a ribeye with bone on it still, okay? But for some reason people, <laughs> this is the, <clears throat> the single greatest marketing scam in the history of restaurants, I swear to God. You can take a ribeye steak, right? I can cut a 400 ounce ribeye steak, right? And I can weigh it in front of you, it's 400 ounces, right? 400 grams, let's say, right? It'll be probably this big, okay? Very nice big steak, right? If I give you the same steak, but call it a, a tomahawk steak with the bone on, you're gonna get about half the amount of meat because that bone weighs a lot. And guess who's paying for that bone? Not this guy, you are. And now you have this photo of you with this big steak on a bone. But you just paid twice as much for half the money, half the steak, right? So that's probably the single greatest uh, scam in the history of the restaurant industry is the tomahawk steak. It's amazing. <clears throat> anyway, so like I said, we're going to put this in for four weeks. You can age for less than four weeks. Three weeks is also pretty good. Anything less than three weeks is pointless. Uh, I've done, I work with different companies like the American Trade Federation, America Beef, Canada Beef, Australia Beef. We've done experiments on aging, on different weeks, how many weeks, different cuts, and then we give, we cook it the same way, and we give it to a control group, a test group. We don't tell them what it is, right? We know what it is. They have plate A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever. And we give them different cuts, different aging, all that kind of stuff, and we ask them for their feedback, okay? Uh, we also give them a, a steak that's unaged, as a placebo, right? And sometimes people say, oh, this one is, tastes more strong and more tender, but that's the unaged one, you know? So we can automatically you know, discredit their opinion. Um, but we found that anything less than three weeks doesn't really give you the tenderness or the flavor enhancement. But you still have to trim away quite a lot. So what you're left with is uh, a high expense, but low benefit. You understand what I mean? So if you age something for two weeks, you have the expense of trimming too much of the, the beef away, right? But you don't get the benefit of the flavor or the tenderness, right? So you get all the negative and none of the positive, right? We found between three to five weeks is the optimum period for aging meat. You get the benefit of the flavor, you get the benefit of the, the tenderness, forget about the juiciness, that doesn't make sense. And the trimming is roughly the same. I have seen meat go all the way up, upwards and past 100 days, okay? So I've had and seen steak that's 100 plus days aged, okay? Uh, and again, that's more of a, I'm not gonna use my knife because my knives are already sharp as hell. Let me bring me a knife, please. Thank you. All right. Now, you was brought to my attention that perhaps you guys don't, I keep talking to you guys about sharpening your knives, right? So it was brought to my attention that maybe you guys don't actually know how to properly sharpen your knife. Were you guys taught in Chinese cooking how to sharpen your knife? So you guys know how to sharpen your knife? No, I don't need to show you. Please show us. Okay, well. I think they think they know. Okay. Normally when I sharpen a knife, I like to use a long, a, quite a long towel so I can drape the towel down, I can press onto it with my hip and that keeps the stone from moving away, okay? Uh, but this, these towels, I don't even know, like this is the most ridiculous kitchen towel I've ever seen. Anyways, I've got a stone here. Stones always have two sides, coarse and fine, okay?
So this is a wet stone, okay? There's two kinds of stones. One is a wet stone with water. One is a wet stone with oil, okay? You should not mix them, okay? Now, I, I sharpen my knives. If you look at my knives, I don't know, if, can you see this on the TV? Yes. Can you guys see the difference, the edge? Yeah. Can you see how long my edge is? Yeah. You see it starts just up here and it ends just down here? Yeah. Whereas, this is your knife, right? Yes. You see his edge? I don't even, I can't even see an edge, right? So my, my knives are sharpened very, very differently. My, my knives are sharpened more like a sword, like a samurai sword or a katana blade, okay? Very, very long edge and a very long point, okay? These are very, very sharp and they stay sharp as long as I keep using my steel, okay? So sharpening steel is not for sharpening knives, right? You know the metal stick that you go choo, 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 okay? That's not for sharpening a knife, okay? That's Your knife, Huh? That's a honing. It's a honing device, yeah. It's to, it's to bring the edge back together, to make, well, we, we call it true, to make the edge true. <laughs> what that's supposed to mean? It sounds like some fairy tale stuff. Hey, my name is Galahad, I'm making the edge true. You're saying it's, it's not for sharpening, right? No, 100% not. Yeah. Okay. No, it's never, it never has been for sharpening. It's called a sharpening steel, okay? But it, what it is meant to do, if your knife is dull, you have to use a, a, a stone. Okay, there's no amount of time you, you guys can go ch -ch 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 -ch. you'd be there until your wrist fell off, okay? The sharpening steel is just to make the edge true again, okay? It's to give it a little enhancement, okay? It's like a little, like, a, like, a, like an espresso, okay? You know, in, in the morning you wake up, you're like, espresso, ah, right? So if your knife is dull, it just woke up, it's like, ooh, oh, I'm not so sharp. This is the espresso for your blade, okay? Ch -ch 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 -ch. Gives it a little bit of a sharpness, brings the edge back to life, but eventually you need to get onto a, a stone. So, as I mentioned, you're gonna want to keep some water handy. Okay, you want to keep that that stone really nice and wet. And in a lot of many kitchens, many hotels, they, in fact, they just keep these things in water all the time. Okay, so they'll have a container, usually under a sink. Okay, with and it's just full of stones. And a lot of kitchens will have won't have a two-sided stone. They'll have one. Fine, uh, one uh, coarse, medium, and fine, okay? At any rate, when you wanna start sharpening, okay? So this edge, this is, this is like what's called like a, a traditional edge, 45 degree angle. And that's like something like this, okay? So I've got it not, so this is a 90 degree angle, right? Obviously you're not gonna sharpen like this, right? <laughs> okay, so you go from 90, you go about halfway down, that's your 45 degree angle, right? And so when you sharpen, you want to just go back and forth like this. And see, I'm, I, I'm sort of, I go through the whole blade, okay? And so I'm carefully keeping pressure on my, the front, the middle, and the back, okay? So I'm trying to make sure that I get the contact, contact on the blade, on the front, the middle, and the back. And I'm pushing right through, okay? And then you can switch. And again, you want to keep a nice amount of water on there. And this takes, and now Sam, you'll have to, you'll have to finish this off at some point, because once you start, you can't really stop. Huh? So this takes about, <laughs> once you start sharpening a knife, it's, you, you have to go through with it, right? So basically you want to do it on all side, both sides for probably about five or ten minutes on each side, cumulative, right? And then you want to switch to the fine side and finish it off for another couple minutes on each side, okay? And that's how you sharpen it and I can already feel it starting to come back a little bit, okay? And you can always tell how sharp a knife is, sharp a knife is just running your thumb on it. I used to work with guys who said like, hey, just run across your thumb like that. I thought like, why would, I, why would I want to cut my thumb? And I say, well, just if, if it goes into your nail, you know it's sharp. It's like, well, I can just go like this, and I can tell you it's sharp. Um, so you can do it like that. You can do it in, in full strokes, okay, like this, okay? Or you can just do it in circular motions like this, okay? Or you can just do it in short distances for each section, right? You understand what I mean? Yeah. So you can do it in a full stroke like this, or you can do it just the tip like this, okay?
the option is yours, right? After you do that, you switch to the find, and then you keep going. After you've worked it for about 20 to 30, about 20 minutes on the stone, okay, and you've got a nice edge on it, then you want to get it on the steel, true the edge up, okay. Also, another thing, another reason we use sharpening steels, after this is sharpened, and now so normally I showed you the traditional way, right? That the 45 degree like this, right? I myself I would actually go more like this to about a 20 degree. So you can see I've gone from this to this, much longer, right? And I would normally do my knives like this, okay, just slow, lots of water, okay, and I would give it, I would give it a much bigger edge, okay, because I prefer that. They stay sharper longer, and I find the edge is just much better, okay, a longer edge, it cuts cleaner, cuts finer, okay. So that's how you sharpen a knife, yeah. After it's been stoned, on the edge itself, there's going to be little burrs, okay, little splinters of metal. That's another reason why we use the sharpening steel. That sharpening steel will get those little burrs off the edge of the knife. When you sharpen a, when you use a sharpening steel, after you use a sharpening steel, you clean your steel with a cloth, you look at it, it'll be black. Okay? And that'll be all the small bits of metal, the shavings from the metal. Okay? One of the reasons I don't like, like I said, I, I prefer to uh, do uh, full strokes myself, okay? as opposed to doing these short ones like this, is because what happens is, Sometimes, I've seen before, uh, knives, knife stones that are actually like bowed in the middle, okay? And that's because somebody has just gone in the middle like this the whole time. And so what happens is you get this part of the stone, this part of the stone, you can't really use it. Because it looks more like a skate park. You'd be better off getting a, 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 a skull and crossbow and skateboard and doing uh, daffy back kicks and stuff. So that's what, another reason why I like to do the full edge to edge uh, uh, sharpen, because then at least I get, my whole stone, I get the money's worth, right? So you're gonna to wanna to just keep going like that, okay? Any questions? Sure? Okay. So, sorry, you're gonna to have to finish this off some other time. Whose stone is this? Uh, he is. You sure? Yeah, Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Okay, now we're done. So we need to clean up. Like I said, there's more 